when we considered some of the different points of view that may be uh, inspired by this work, we did briefly toy with trying to get a milliner in to talk about the change in fashion and the hats. And I think it's telling that the faces of those men who aren't wearing hats are particularly unhappy up there. <laughs> Uh, they may be uh, on fashion, but they're not happy about it. Um, Gideon Haig has been a journalist for 30 years, uh, and in that time he's published 30 books, which uh, is an impressive uh, level of output. He's also edited another seven. He is uh, the author of uh, books on a range of topics, including uh, what I would consider a must-read on, uh, on The Office. Uh, that you should have a look at. But today he'll be talking about that stretch of Collins Street as a commercial location and as a sporting one. Please welcome Gideon Haig. 30 years ago, 30 years after John Brack's loiterings, I was spending a lot of time on uh, this particular part of, uh, of Melbourne, which at the time hosted the trading floor of the Melbourne Stock Exchange, where I was cutting my teeth as a junior business reporter. Collins House, where Brack, as Kirsty has said, did his original sketches for this painting, was gone a decade by then. But there was still a street sign directing you there, which I loved. One of those vestigial presences of a city's past that it can be eons before anyone thinks to remove. Collins Street is, of course, a diverse street. Boulevard of entertainment with theatres, avenue of observance with churches, Locus of power proclaimed uh, visibly in the town hall, discreetly in the Melbourne Club. Yet Brack somehow seemed to intuit where the action was, that he was standing at an axis of post-war prosperity, an intersection of Australian capitalism. Built in 1911, the bluestone edifice of Collins House had perhaps the greatest concentration of economic power in Australia's history, certainly our earliest equivalent of an American trust or a Japanese zaibatsu or a Korean chai bowl. Within its walls were the executive offices, secretariats and counting houses for numberless enterprises integral to Australia's emergence as an industrial economy, built on mining, but extending by this stage to secondary production. Zinc Corporation, Imperial Smelting, BH South, North BH, Broken Hill Associated Smelters, EZ Industries, Western Mining, Carlton and United Breweries, Associated Pulp and Paper Mills, Metal Manufacturers, Austral Bronze, Yarra Falls. It was linked by directorships also to Dunlop, The Herald and Weekly Times, Barnet Glass and Mount Isa Mines. To put together the consortium for a new Australian business in the 1920s and 30s was as simple as walking along its corridors. As of 1955, however, the constituents of this conglomeration were being prized apart by their size and divergence, testament to the destabilising properties of economic growth, how it inculcates individual ambition, competing objectives, dynamics that outgrow the original personal bindings. The first generation of Collins House leaders, W.L. Bailey, W.S. Robinson, Sir Colin Fraser, were dead or ageing. The next generation, Morris Morby, Lindsay Clark, Bill Morgan, and in due course, Avi Parbo, were emerging. Zinc Corporation had combined with Imperial Smelting and decamped uptown, destined to merge with Rio Tinto and build Melbourne's tallest skyscraper, with twice the number of stories of the previous landmark, and the basis of what today is one of the world's three biggest mining companies. Collins House was, in the meantime, filling with new tenants, one of them being the business where John Brack's friend John Stevens worked, Ian Potter and co. Potter himself was a vanguard figure in the maturation of Australia's capital markets, a trend with profound social and political significance. Labor's failure to nationalise the banks in 1949, having ushered in the long conservative ascendancy to which Gary referred to before. That the only words in Brack's painting are Bank of New South Wales, subtly attests the financial sector's growing influence. It was the Wales' descendant, Westpac, who eventually came to occupy the site of the former Collins House, effacing its former grandeur with its rather drab skyscraper. Peter Yule's excellent Life of Ian Potter tells us that in the decade after the war, what had hitherto been a small firm of about 15 people grew to a staff of more than 100. 
Potter was building the great fortune, he would apply in great measure to public enrichment. How excellent that Collins Street 5 p.m. should now be housed in the Ian Potter Centre. There were also, Yule informs us, complaints in this time among loyal staff that his firm was losing some of its former intimacy and collegiality. In other words, it was undergoing the trend towards impersonality to which all successful organisations are heir. And this, of course, is one of the levels of Brack's painting, illuminating the evolution of a new urban white-collar middle class which worked in the cities and lived in the suburbs and whose pulmonary movements to and fro were becoming as much natural phenomenon as sunrise and sunset or the habits of migratory birds. Only in 1950 had the urban population of Australia exceeded the non-urban, but the trend was set and Brack identified it. He wrote, there are so many of us whose lives are encompassed by offices in the day and the suburbs at night that it seems almost urgent for the painter to say something about it as clearly as he can. The sensibility actually calls to mind Dickens's portrait of the London of clerks and commissionaires, beadles and bill collectors a century earlier. The slits of the mouths on Brack's commuters recall Dickens's description of John Wemmick in Great Expectations, who Pip sees in Jaggers's office feeding bits of hard biscuit into his slit of a mouth as though he were posting them. In fact, I'm sure Brack had that description in mind a year earlier in his pencil drawing The Manager's Lunch, his superb anticipation of the custom of dining al desco. <laughs> Pip's portrait of Wemmick is one of the first perceptive analyses of the necessary sensibility of office work. At home in Walworth, you'll remember, Pip finds Wemmick the most expansive and humane of hosts. He observes that as they approach the office, that his colleague assumes his professional persona. By degrees, Wemmick got drier and harder as we went along, and his mouth tightened into a post office again. Brack's characters, we know, are leaving the office, but they still have, as it were, their game faces on. It's as much a part of their white-collar guys as their collars, ties and coats. But we're talking here about more than work. Brack's human tides are experiencing the social forces delineated 50 years earlier by the German social theorist George Simmel in his essay, The Metropolis and Mental Life, where he proposed that city life is never more acutely pressured than in the migration from home to work and back again. That before the development of buses, roads and trains, people had never been in a position of having to look at one another for long minutes or even hours without speaking to one another. To endure the bombardment of nervous stimuli and the blitz of fractured sensations, Simmel proposed, the city dweller learned to mute their responses, to deaden themselves to the city's demands, to affect a blasé indifference to the uproar around them by growing what he called a second skin. Their only agreement was in a shared punctiliousness about time. He wrote, if all watches in Berlin were suddenly to go wrong in different ways, even by only one hour, all economic life and communication in the city would be disrupted for a long time. To choose another Berlin intertext, there's an instructive contrast between Brax's Collins Street 5pm and the scenes of commuters in Walter Ruttmann's 1927 movie, Berlin Symphony of a City, where the images of the insensate masses approaching their work is interspersed with footage of cattle being herded and soldiers marching in step. There's no avoiding the, uh, that uniformity had a context 60 years ago. In 1955, the Pax Menziana had been initiated, ratified and reinforced, but it was still the case that Australia had been at war for more than a quarter of the preceding 40 years. Brack and his friend Stevens had both served in the RAAF. There's an aura of discipline around these workers that's almost martial. They move in seeming formation, not quite absolute, but at a pace regulated by their companions, progressing eyes front in a quasi-uniform that might almost be khaki drab. They are willing conscripts, embracing their embourgeoisement for a security unknown to previous generations, but more constrained in their choices, more similar in their outlooks, more structured in their occupations, more regulated in their upward mobility. But they are conscripts all the same. Nonetheless, despite Brax's judgment of his own work that Kirsty quoted before, I think this is an altogether more disarming image. 
In Ruttman's film, the commuters are filmed from behind so as to be unidentifiable, Individually, individuality sunk in the mass, their labour required but not their humanity. Brack doesn't give us that. In these wonderfully expressive and terribly Australian faces, each starkly unique, even in repose, he offers us uneffaceable individuality. He also gives us, and I don't think this is a mischance or an irrelevance, Collins Street 5pm, not Collins Street 8.30am. These people are bound for, well, perhaps the pub uh, in time for six o'clock closing, where Brack had already captured them in the bar, or for home and hearth, where they will presumably enjoy some of the fruits of their labours. They are part of that necessary movement which, which Hannah Arendt would describe three years later in The Human Condition between the implacable bright light of the constant presence of others in the public scene and the darkness of sheltered existence, which configured the self to contribute to the evolution of the public good. Sixty years later, we might even whimsically envy these souls, leaving work behind at 5 p.m., who does that anymore in this era of 24-7 connectivity, nagging job insecurity and constant panoptical supervision? Leave work behind? Good heavens. A personal postscript. Fifteen years ago, I had cause to return to this trampled stretch of street where I researched and wrote a biography of a most remarkable man called Jack Iverson. Iverson, born in 1915, led an otherwise unremarkable life. He went to school, he went to war, he became an estate agent. In one attribute, he was freakish. Huge hands, immensely powerful fingers, which he enjoyed flexing from an early age by squeezing out a table tennis ball that spun prodigiously. In long periods of inactivity in the army, in the Middle East and Papua New Guinea, he became a virtuoso at French cricket, breaking the ball vast distances, when he, and when he came back, decided to try doing the same with a cricket ball. Cricket was a game that he liked, but he'd never shown any previous aptitude for. In 1946, Jack Iverson was playing in the third 11 at Brighton. Four years later, Jack Iverson played for Australia and was the match winner when his country retained the Ashes in Sydney. Just as quickly, for various reasons, he packed it in, a gentle, sensitive, rather impractical man, he would take his own life in 1973. 1955 was the first year full-time that Jack worked at J.B. Iverson Proprietary Limited, whose office was at the back of Aldersgate House, 405 Collins Street, diagonally opposite where Brack was doing his sketching. Unfortunately, Wheeler Centre Technology is incapable of showing you the picture that I have of this tall, hatchet-faced, crew-cut figure, but I like to think of him right here. I promise. It became intrinsic to the image I developed of Jack Iverson, the button-down bourgeois in his urban camouflage who briefly became the best slow bowler in the world, then returned from whence he came. Testament to the usually untapped extraordinary latent in the ordinary. For good reason do we keep coming back to Collins Street 5 p.m. For all the constraints and rigidities it appears to express, it is an image of infinite subtlety and suppleness.